All right. It is great to be here, whatever being here means these days online. I mean, I'm here, you're here. Um, we have no idea who's wearing pants and who isn't, but but we're all here and that's um, and that's good. And I can even see a bunch of you, which is really nice because um, I can uh, get feedback. So hello, Dolores and Pauline and Ben and Mariana and uh, Paul, et cetera. Um, very nice to be here. My uh, Many years ago, my daughter is now 23 years old, but many years ago uh, when she was little, I was um, reading her a story from the Magic Treehouse books. You guys, some of you know those um, those books. And uh, and in the middle of my my telling her that reading her this story, she asked me a question. She you know she said I don't understand how do they get to these these new places. And I I started answering her question. I said you know they they look at these books and then they're magically transported the pictures. Um, and in the middle of my answer, my daughter Michal walked away. And and I said Michal, where are you going? I, I haven't finished answering your question. And she said, but Daddy, I've finished listening. So if any of you have finished listening before I've finished talking, um, it's okay, I, I understand. But I'm only gonna talk uh, for about 15 minutes and, um, and, uh, and we might even have a little time for um, some exchange. And what I'm gonna talk to you about this morning is um, this rather grand title, Can Education Save Democracy? Because um, we all know that there are various ways uh, that democracy is in trouble right now. And I wanna start with a thought experiment. So if you can imagine for a minute that I have whisked you up in the air out of your virtual or real space. Um, I have whisked you through the, uh, the ceiling of the room you're in, um, maybe through a few floors above you and out the roof of your building and into the air. Uh, you can see the city or town down below you and you keep going up through the atmosphere, through the stratosphere and boom, you're in space. And you look down on that beautiful globe below you uh, and you, the, you know, it's a thought experiment. So let's pretend you can breathe and there's no problem up there. It's very quiet, it's peaceful. And you see the earth slowly spinning below you. Uh, and suddenly you feel a little rumbling and you start descending and you are coming down through space, through the stratosphere, through the atmosphere, through the air, down through the roof of a building, boom, 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 a couple of floors and boom, you land in a seat and you look around and you realize that you are in a classroom somewhere. But here's the thought question, and you can put up the next slide, please. Um, would you know, after you watch a lesson for a little while, let's say you watch half an hour, and again, it's a thought experiment, let's pretend you can't tell where you are based on the clothes people are wearing or the language they're speaking. Would you be able to tell whether you had landed in a classroom in a democratic country, or whether you had landed in one with a totalitarian regime or a military dictatorship or a religious theocracy, would you be able to tell? So uh, go ahead and, and uh, let me know. Would you, do you think you'd be able to tell? So if you can access the Learn Lab code, um, it, you should be able to pop in. Okay, they're coming up, Joel. What fun, this is so interactive. I'm a very low tech presenter, so this is, this is just a blast. Okay, so um, a lot of people are not sure. And I, I, I think that's great because many of us would love to be able to say, um, of course we could tell, right? Uh, you mean our schools should have nothing to do and not look much at all like schools in say North Korea uh, or China um, or, or somewhere else. Right, because we think, well, we, you know, democratic schools um, would look would look different. Um, and uh, you can go back a slide, actually, now if that's okay. Uh, and uh, so, what I want to be asking is, uh, if we have that question, would we be able to tell whether schools, uh, whether we would be able to know whether it's a democratic country? It raises another question, which is the one that interests me most. Right. And that is this, what should be different in schools in a democratic society than schools in, let's say, a dictatorship? 
And I want to make this a little more difficult because, um, you know, here uh, in North America, we like to say, and in elsewhere in the in the Western world, we like to think that okay, totalitarianism bad, uh, democracy good. Okay, but let's take that out of the equation. I'm going to make um, Pauline the benevolent dictator of our our dictatorship. Okay, and Pauline has all of our best interests in heart. Okay, she is a nice person. She wants to do what's right for the people. Uh, she's not squirreling money off to the Cayman Islands. She's not passing jobs to her family members. She's a good person, but she's a dictator, okay? A benevolent dictator. Now in Pauline's dictatorship, she would have no interest in what the rest of us think about how we should live together or how we should run the government because she knows best, right? She's gonna make the decisions based on what's good for us and hand those down. Now she might have a small group of advisors. She might have a, a, a military junta or um, some priests who are gonna help her decide, but um, she's gonna do what she thinks is right. Democracies require something different from their citizens. It goes back to the uh, famous quote by Thomas Jefferson, which I will paraphrase badly here, um, that if, if the people in a democracy are not well-educated enough to govern their own affairs, the solution is not to take that power of governance away from them and give it to Pauline, but rather to educate them. Right? And that is the founding purpose of public education in many countries around the world, that for in order for democratic society to work, we need people who are well-educated enough to govern their own affairs and to participate, right? So let's look at a, a, a couple of, um, of pictures. If you can put up uh, the next slide, okay? Would we know um, where this is, right? This is a classroom. Uh, somewhere around the world would we would we know where it is anyone anyone want to guess oops um that is a school in brazil um next slide this is a school in missouri next slide this is a school in uh, Detroit, I believe. Next slide. This is a school in Cuba. Next slide. This is a school in Indonesia. Next slide. This is a school in France. Next slide. We don't know where this school is. Next slide. This is a school in China. Okay. Um, and you can take the slides away now if you would like and just um, put me front and center because I'm an egomaniac. Um, and uh, so when we think about what schools would look like in different countries, right, and in different ways, when you think about a lesson in, in you know, fractions or balancing an equation in chemistry or teaching a foreign language, um, many of those lessons might be the same in many parts of the world, right? And so it again comes back to that question that I raised, what should be different about schools in a democratic society? And I wanna propose a couple of things right now. Um, I, uh, first of all, we know that we are in a time of diminishing commitments to democracy, right? So political scientists used to refer to well-established democracies as consolidated democracies. Countries like the United States and Canada and France and Germany and so on uh, are countries where what political scientists thought for decades is that no one would imagine in these countries another route to power other than winning an election. In other words, no one would imagine, you know, we could run for power and win the election, or we could try and organize a military coup and take power that way, right? In these countries, um, that option is off the table and it's called a consolidated democracy. But recently, political scientists have, begin have begun to walk that certainty back. And they are now talking about a new term called deconsolidating democracies democracies that were once thought of as fully consolidated, as solid, as no, go back, no going back, past the point of no return, 
they now realize are vulnerable to a process called deconsolidation. And of course, they point to countries like Brazil, like the United States, uh, like some of the uh, happenings in the Netherlands um, with the far right uh, parties um, in Germany, um, in France with Marie Le Pen. And they point to signs, including growing economic inequality that are worrying precursors to the deconsolidation of democratic, of the rule of democratic law. And of course, we saw this play out right on our television screens on January 6th in the United States, okay? But here's a couple of statistics I wanna share with you as well. In 1995, just one in 16 Americans agreed with the idea that it would be good or very good to have the military run the country rather than elected democratic officials, okay? One in 16 in 1995. Today, one in five Americans think that that might be a good idea. One other statistic, nearly one in four Americans think democracy is a bad way to run the country and would like to live under a political system in which a strong leader who didn't have to bother with elections or the courts or Congress as interference, who could just make decisions by themselves, uh, one in four Americans think that that would be a good idea too, to have a strong leader instead of democratic processes. But here's what keeps me up at night. And I think that what should keep all of us up at night as educators, half, almost half of millennials think that. Let me let that sink in for a second. Almost half of millennials think that they would prefer to live under a strong leader who didn't have to bother with elections or interference from the courts or legislatures to the current democratic system. Now we can forgive some millennials for thinking of this because they've, they've grown up uh, you know, partly under Trump and they've seen um, the problems with democratic governance. I can give you statistics for any of the countries that any of you are from as well. Um, some of them are not as dramatic as the US, but in almost every uh, democratic country around the world, the percentage of young people who no longer have strong commitments to democratic institutions has risen sharply in the last 15 years. So what does that put on us? What responsibility do we have as educators? Well, I, I think we have a great deal. And I want to just share with you for two minutes uh, some research that my colleague Joe Kahn and I have been doing for, uh, for several decades about the way schools teach democratic education. Okay, before I do that, let me just say that democratic education means many things to many people, right? Uh, we can talk about teaching democratically, meaning the students decide the curriculum or the students have say in what's going on in the classroom, okay? We can talk about um, teaching about democracy, meaning students learn how the government works and how you know, a bill becomes a law. Some of you remember those Schoolhouse Rock videos. I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill. Um, that would be teaching about democracy. And another one, this is not an exhaustive list, is teaching for democracy, right? That means preparing students to participate in a robust democratic society and to help to improve that society. It's that last version that I'm going to talk about not the pedagogy necessarily, okay? We could teach by, by having a democratic classroom or not. There's, there's many arguments for both. Um, but what I'm talking about is education that is squarely uh, aimed at teaching for dem democracy. So to create a more robust democratic society. Now, when Joe Kahn and I, uh, we've now, we started with 10 programs um, many, many years ago, but we've now looked at hundreds and other people have used our framework um, that is now translated into like 27 different languages um, to look at thousands of schools uh, around the world. And we, and they looked at, we've looked at programs that aim to teach citizenship in schools, teach good citizenship, right? What does it mean to be a good citizen? Andy showed you the, the cover of my book, what kind of citizen? And that's what I'm going to be asking all of you, right? What kind of citizens do we wanna see leaving uh, our schools uh, when they graduate? Uh, we found that loosely thinking, you know how professors love to categorize things and put them in boxes, right? So we found that loosely thinking, um, the programs that we saw in schools could fall into three visions of what a good citizen is. 
We call these three visions the personally responsible citizen, the participatory citizen, as in participation, and the social justice oriented citizen. I'm going to quickly tell you what those what those meant. You can look uh, find more about this um, on the website that I put in the chat. The personally responsible citizen, those programs want kids to be good people, to follow the school rules, to obey the law, uh, to pay their taxes, to dress nicely, to help an old person across the street, not to litter, don't do drugs, right? These are um, what many schools would call uh, character education. You know that you have character education program in your school if there's posters everywhere that talk about the principles of good character. So we have like, you know, Monday is honesty, uh, Tuesday is integrity, uh, Wednesday, you don't have to be honest anymore because that was Monday. But you know, there's these uh, kind of uh, pillars of, of good character in school, right, that kids should follow. Now, a vast majority of school-based programs advance a personally responsible vision of good citizenship, right? Good people, the kind of people you'd like to live next door to, right? The kind of people um, who would be nice to you, who would help you and who wouldn't break the law, okay? But we also found programs that advance a more participatory vision of good citizenship. These are programs that want students to know how to get involved in their communities, how to make things happen, how to work with others, okay? Uh, an example that might be helpful is if, if the participatory citizens, if those programs are um, organizing a food drive to collect food for people who are hungry or homeless in their neighborhood, what would the personally responsible citizens be doing? They'd be donating cans of food, right? Because they're nice people. Uh, so they, they'd be bringing in a can of food. Now, let me just tell you about the third vision. The third vision is the social justice oriented citizen. Um, there's been many debates over the years about whether those that's the right words to call it. Um, those are tainted words now, but, but I'm just gonna explain what it means, right? The social justice oriented citizens, these are programs that have this vision of citizenship. They want students to ask and inquire and explore the root causes of problems in society. They might teach students how social change works. They might um, look historically at uh, the way that improvements in society have happened, the civil rights movement, um, the women's rights movement, the gay rights movement, et cetera. And they want students to ask difficult questions about the root causes of problems. So if I use that example that I gave before, if the participatory citizens are organizing a food drive, the personally responsible citizens are donating cans of food, the social justice oriented citizens are asking, why in one of the richest countries in the world do we have people who are hungry? And what can we do about it? Okay. Why in such a wealthy country should there be people who are hungry? And what are possible solutions? Now, we don't know what the solutions are. It could be anything. Uh, this isn't a partisan exercise, right? We could say that the solution is to raise taxes or to lower taxes. But the importance is in the question itself. Because let's go back a second. If we think about that personally responsible citizen, the one who obeys the laws, who pays taxes, who gives blood, who doesn't do drugs, who doesn't litter, who helps people, okay? There is not a country on the planet whose leaders would not be happy if they had those kinds of citizens, right? So that might have something to do with good citizenship, the leaders of North Korea, of China, of Indonesia, of Iran, of Iraq, all, everyone would want those kinds of citizens. Nobody wants citizens who throw garbage in the street or who don't pay taxes, right? So that might have something to do with good citizenship, but it has absolutely nothing to do with democratic citizenship. Because in a democracy, we require young people and old people alike to be aware of the great debates of our times, to take on the difficult questions, to think critically about the world around them and know that they have a role to play in helping to improve society. In other words, um, 
Andy and Trista know that my wife is in is a is an English professor, and so I learn a lot about literary theory from her. And there's this wonderful literary theorist, Amanda Anderson, who uh, says that she thinks that all of literary criticism should be concerned with the question, "How should we live?" And I think that that's a wonderful guiding question for schools in a democratic society. How should we live? All of education should be linked in some way to the question of how should we live? Because how should we live is a very radical but very important question. It's radical because it implies that we have choices about the ways that we should organize ourselves. We have choices about the distribution of resources and about access to rights and various responsibilities. That it is the student's role and all of our role to engage with the political process. Right? Um, in, in, in too many places now, the word politics has become a dirty word. Right? If I say, Steve, you're just being political, it's like I've insulted him. He's like a mudslinging candidate running for office. But politics has a much more noble history. Uh, there's a famous book by Bernard Crick called In Defense of Politics. And in that, he says that politics is the way that people in a democratic society come together to work out their differences and move forward because we have to compromise. We're not all going to agree. So we all have a responsibility to engage with those debates of our times. Now, what does that mean for schools? It means that schools have to teach critical analysis of important ideas. They have to teach current debates, not just stale debates. Uh, it's not that schools have to teach that the Holocaust was bad and that it turns out Jews are real people too, uh, or that black people are just as smart as white people, right? Those are uh, debates that are settled in society, even if we have fringe elements who still question them. What we have to teach is the current controversies of our times, because those are the ones that allow our students to engage critically with the world around them. There's a saying among teachers, everyone likes to teach critical thinking, but no one wants a classroom full of critical thinkers <laughs> right? because who wants people questioning everything they say or do? Um, but that is the difficult work that we need to do. Um, and uh, I could go on, of course, uh, for, for a great deal of time because this is a subject that's very dear to me on other things that schools need to do. And those are, are certainly well detailed um, in the book, What Kind of Citizen? But I'm also happy to engage with any of you uh, privately and off this, I'm easy to find on Twitter and by email um, and through the ARC website and so on. So uh, I'm going to leave it there with a quote by one of my favorite educators, Maxine Green. Uh, she's a philosopher of education who was a, was a dear mentor and a dear friend of mine. Uh, she, she died some a few years ago. She was 97 years old. And Maxine Green once said this. She said that the purpose of education is to comfort the troubled and trouble the comfortable. And what she meant is that, of course, as, lead, as education leaders and as teachers, we need to create spaces in schools that are comfortable for our students, where they feel safe, free from bullying, free to try out new ideas, free to fail and try again. But if we stop there, that's not enough for democratic education. It's not enough for schools in a democratic society because what democracies need is citizens that are a little bit uncomfortable too. Uncomfortable in the sense that they know that there are problems in the world and in their society and that they are not someone else, but they and all of us um, have a role to play in shaping the coming history of our society and improving things to make them better for all of us. Thank you very much.